right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in for the second part of the podcast I have with Broderick Charvez on hormones. Broderick, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, and I'm so excited about the questions that we're going into today. I'm so surprised they didn't scare you off. I'm surprised that I am getting the second part. So uh, I'm 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 ready. I'm ready to roll. Let, let's uh, let's let it rip. I can't I, I can't get enough of you to be honest. And I think the listeners feel the same way. So I'm really looking forward to this. So yeah, thank you so much for being back. And we'll jump into the the questions. In the previous podcast we had together, we were talking about um, nutrition to optimize muscle hypertrophy, and yeah. we touched we touched a bit about the importance of of uh, of fat um, mm-hmm. so dietary fat how important is that to keep your levels of hormones optimized because if you look at the literature there's some literature suggesting that if you go from 20% of your caloric intake from fat and increase that to 40% it might have a positive effect on your testosterone levels but then again mm-hmm. it becomes unclear if it's is it actually the dietary fat or is it actually the levels of body fat levels that you have on your body that's affecting these hormones? Or simply the calorie surplus. Is it just simply that you have more calories available? Um, I'm, a, I'm about to get a ton of hate mail, and it's mostly going to come from Holland. But um, I am deeply convinced that Fat is the most overstated, overrated, over-talked about thing in all of nutrition. Okay. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, no really effective research has been done on optimal levels. Most of the research I'm aware of is on a very practical thing, and that is the minimum value necessary to sustain life. This world has a lot more starving people than Otherwise, so the minimum value necessary to keep people alive and functioning is where most of the valid research exists. That number is shockingly and shamefully low. It's 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 horrendously low. It's down in the like 0.1 grams per kilogram daily. It's a it's an absurdly low number. The World Health Organization, I think, pegged it at 0.2 grams per kilogram. So. And they're notoriously, notoriously conservative. So that's a really small amount. I mean, you know, let, let's be fair. That that number is almost, almost insignificant. Now, where that optimal number is for human performance is anyone's guess. But what you can say is if the minimum value is that low, raising that number many orders of magnitude still puts you in a pretty low-fat range. There's absolutely no evidence that I accept as valid that suggests these, you know, you commensurate macro numbers, you know, like one third of your daily calories or you know, even one fifth of your daily calories coming from fats has any additional benefit other than making eating very easy. You don't have to be particularly discerning. You just fucking eat. That has a certain value for sure. Rather than belabor all the things I don't know, because I just there's no research and I don't know, what I can relate to you and your listeners is what I do. And what I do is we've, you know, I've pretty well identified what's considered the minimum value. That's probably too small for athletes. What I've identified is what I believe to be the maximum practical value. And now you have a range in which to exist. I think that's useful. And that maximum practical value is about one gram per kilogram of fat daily. And now if you clear your mind and stop recoiling and acting offended and all the dumb shit, and you actually realize, oh, I weigh 80 kilograms, 80 grams of fat's a pretty sensible fucking number. Like, that's a number. If you ate whole foods and you didn't dip everything in coconut oil or smear butter on it, Fuck, that's about the amount of fat you get from food. And coincidentally, that's what we're supposed to be eating, folks, food. So it it doesn't seem aberrant to me that if you get two to three grams of nitrogen per kilogram from meat 
and you eat whole food, grains and vegetables, when you d- dial that out, when you dilute that and distill that down, you get about one gram of fat per kilogram. It, it, it's it's probably not a coincidence that each answer leads you to the next correct answer or seemingly correct answer. People just write books and books and volumes and volumes on fucking diet. And literally, you can write everything you need to know on a goddamn post-it note. Shoot for two to three grams of nitrogen per kilogram. Shoot for one gram of fat per kilogram. Eat the difference of your calories from high-quality, high-fiber carbohydrates. Book is done. That's it. I mean, you could get complicated and talk about protein sources and some things are better than others and carbohydrate sources and glycemic index and even fat. But at the end of the day, there's, there's really only three fats. There's, you know, saturated, unsaturated, you know, mono and poly and unsaturated and saturated. That's basically all you got. Saturated fat, mono unsaturated and poly unsaturated. Very roughly speaking, shoot for a, a third of each. And coincidentally, if you eat red flesh fish or red flesh meat, you're going to get about that one third. You know, if you eat, you know, high fiber, high quality grains and things, you're going to get some protein from non you know, saturated sources. Again, if you just follow the basic shit we actually do know, all of the rest of it fills itself in. The chart fills in for, for itself. You, it, you don't even need your involvement. Just stop being an asshole and stop trying to invent the wheel and keep trying to be clever. Oh, if I just get this ratio, magic will happen. Or if I just get that ratio, there's no magic, folks. It still comes down to just fucking eat the food, lift the weights, and fucking sleep, and stop being an asshole. That's, God, that's my book. Stop being an asshole. Uh, It's a big title right across the front. Jesus, I'm sorry. All of the merciful. I am close to a stroke. I'm sorry. I think that's the best. (laughs) The the best advice is actually the last one. Don't be an asshole. No, That's the most important. Yeah, yeah. The, the the funny thing is that, like, I mainly work with with athletes, and like one of the questions I often get is, well, uh, what do you think about these high fat diets and for performance and stuff? And the thing is that I actually conducted a study last year on cyclists where we actually fed them a, a high fat diet a day before they cycled. Uh, we didn't really see any difference on performance but when we looked at their bloods like we took eight blood samples we actually see even with a a acute high fat meal uh insulin resistance happening in the athlete with high fat yeah 100 percent. and strangely you get more insulin resistance from fat Mm -hmm. than you get from carbohydrates yeah oh that's oh my god the world's gonna end oh Right now, Dave Palumbo's trembling. Right now, he's oh. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's uh, and the thing is that if you actually start to look at the research, like we had the acute study, which also has been shown previously that eat a high fat meal, it actually leads to insulin resistance. But if you sustain that for a couple of days, you actually see down regulations in enzymes that can oxidize Agreed. carbohydrates. So uh, again, something I point out to people all the time is. We, again, being a biologist, I kind of look at this shit a little different. We, being people, are very fragile creatures. Compared to animals in the wild, we have crap ability to regulate our heat. We don't have claws. We don't have fangs. We don't have fur. We don't have so many advantages that the rest of nature does have. What we do have is an extraordinarily high ability to adapt very few creatures other than humans are capable of living on every single landmass on this planet there are humans from pole to pole every continent around the world try that with a you know, take fish x or y out of the water here and throw it in the water there it will die it lacks the adaptability that's the thing people always you know do this well i've been eating nothing but you know red meat for six months i'm like Yeah, because you were gifted with an incredibly adaptive creature that doesn't want to die. It will live on anything. Is that the same as being performance-based, or is that what your body really wants? No, but can you? Yes. We have Eskimos that have been living, you know, for tens of thousands of years on, you know, whale blubber and fish scales. I bet they really want cake, 
But they can live on that. Like it's it's proven now. We can do that. I don't know why you would. I don't understand the point. But the point is, is you can do that and not die because the fundamental overriding concept of biology is that first page one, chapter one. Don't fucking die. If you can pull that off, then you get to the cool shit like you know reproduction, iPhones, tweeting about the weather. What the fuck? So it starts with don't die. So we've been given this incredibly adaptive thing that cannot die under a wide array of conditions. Why that has to then become nutritional dogma eludes me, but there you have it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's uh let's uh I think th- I think the, uh, that's a that's a great point that you mentioned there. <sighs> Next question is um and now we're talking about like natural natural not enhance people what okay. what do you need to do to like keep your levels optimized of testosterone like what can you do with your is there anything you can do with your diet is there anything you can do with your lifestyle etc etc um well first of all let me predicate this with that's absolutely not my area my area really professionally is and let's add a bunch more so that's that's who i am so The reality is there's probably people in, in in the field that would be much better at answering that question. Lyle McDonald is somebody I would tackle that question with. Maybe even Steve Hall. Those are people that wrestle with that on a day-to-day level in their profession. I don't. So what I'm about to tell you is purely supposition and assumption based on what I know about biology. Okay, with that predication, I would say, first of all, by and large – Testosterone values are very consistent over the bell curve of age. Very low at childhood, very high at pubescence, and then they taper down. Okay? So any expectation that's not that is slightly irrational. Okay? So every time this 40-year-old guy comes to me and I'm like, I don't understand why my testosterone's lower than it was when I was 18. I'm like, mm, maybe because you're not fucking 18. So the reality is that's normal. So to a small degree, even these natural assholes that are, you know, banner wavers, champions of naturalness, they're actually seeking an unnatural outcome. Because the natural outcome is every year after your 20th birthday, that number goes down. That's natural. Anything that's not that is contrivance. But even in the realm of contrivance, things that you can do to sustain that number is maintain even constant levels of exercise, not big breaks. The cyclic nature of most people's behavior is the worst thing. Consistency and signaling, and exercise is one of those signals. Not exercising is one of those signals. So if one maintains muscle mass and one doesn't, consistently signaling the maintenance of muscle mass, very important. So not taking six-month hiatuses, not fucking off, not, you know, consistently hammering the build muscle, maintain muscle, build muscle, maintain muscle is step one. Step two, within the confines of that, don't overtrain. And Overtraining, I, I, I don't want to go down this road because it's a podcast all by itself, but overtraining is more than you just lifted weights too much. Overtraining is an overall concept. It's like putting your finger on exactly why a business went bankrupt. Sometimes it is just one really shitty deal and like, wow, if they hadn't done that, everything would be fine. But most of the time, it's a collection of bad habits. They had too many employees. They did a little too much advertising. They this, they this, they this. And the outcome was collectively failure. That's what overtraining is. It's not that, oh, your training frequency was wrong or your training intensity was wrong. It's your training intensity, your training frequency in concert with your cardio, in concert with your job, in concert with your sleep habits. So when I say overtraining, it's that whole amalgam of lifestyle that your total net pluses and negatives in the stress realm. Keep that shit under control. That's that. Something I will touch on that I'm very dubious of, but I'll mention it because people smarter than me and more ingrained in the subject than me will point out, Lyle McDonald jumps to mind, that the maintaining consistent 
sufficient, and there's a big argument about what sufficient is, that's my point, but anyway, maintaining a consistent, sufficient value of saturated fat does seem to have some long-term influence on hormone levels. Now, what that threshold value is, I'm not prepared to argue it. I think it's very, very low, but talk to one of those other experts for more information. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, you do see like long term like uh, vegetarian diets where saturated fat is particularly suppressed. You do tend to see a, a commensurate suppression in sex hormones. So there probably is some correlation there. But most athletes are not living on fucking lettuce. They're you know eating meat, and therefore it's probably not much of a relevant conversation. But I'll hold out the c- concept that maybe. But in general, that's what you got. Manage your activity. You know, the big overtraining thing, maintain consistency. That's pretty much all you got is your tools at hand. You know, there's no secret routes. There's no magic rubs or potions, you know, saunas. None, none of that shit's going to have a long-term effect other than it might make you feel good and you feeling good might tip some little minor scale toward the balance of goodness on some ledger sheet in the sky there's probably some validity and state of mind but in general no medical benefit from that shit really awesome next question we're going into is uh, like we know that even though we have studies from the past that said that anabolic steroids didn't have an effect on muscle growth Uh, Oh, my God. We actually know that they are very effective. But could you please explain why they work so well for uh, enhancing muscle growth? What is actually happening with, for example, protein synthesis and stuff like that? Absolutely, I can. Uh, Again, part of my always, I want to make one little uh, adjustment to the language. Please do. Testosterone is a steroid for sure. However, it is not an anabolic steroid. Okay, that is a key thing. Uh, something I recommend everyone do. It seems to be very out of vogue, but go buy a fucking dictionary, folks. Look up these words. It's important. It's the language. If you don't know what you're saying, really hard to have a conversation. A steroid is one thing. An anabolic steroid is another. And just for your information, the definition of an anabolic steroid is a synthetic derivative of testosterone testosterone is defined as an androgen anything derived from testosterone is an anabolic steroid sounds like subtle wordplay but it's actually not both medically and legally a lot of places around the world differentiate them under the law because well they're different fucking things so i'm not just talking nonsense there's relevance here okay so having said that at Now that I've taken the time to separate them, you could kind of put them back in the same bag in that testosterone and anabolic steroids all bind to the same receptor. They're all assorted keys that fit in the same lock. Okay, so we'll kind of use that corny sing-song analogy of lock and key, drug and receptor. It's horribly inadequate and not up to the task, but I won't go into the whys and hows because for this part of the conversation, it's sufficient. So you've got key floating, tumbling through the blood. You've got drug in the blood, and it finds its way to the lock. There's this magic thing called reception. It's the key going into the lock, and then there's transmission. The key turns the lock and transmits a message now if you think of a muscle cell which is where this is happening there's a surface of a muscle cell and this lock is on the surface key goes in it there's a distance that needs to be traveled to the nucleus if you think of the nucleus as kind of the brain center it's in the middle of the cell there's a a space so that's the transmission part something called cyclic amp is the messenger molecule that goes from the receptor swims essentially through the cell to the nucleus and now transmits the message, okay? That message, in the case of testosterone, is very general. I'll come to more why that's relevant in a second, but the message is very relevant. It's general. It sends, build some protein, retain some water, manipulate electrolytes in a certain way, store some carbohydrates, So the message is all very general, but all very kind of in the direction of shit that's going to lead to 
more, more effective muscle. Okay. Some of that message has to do with the way, you know, nerves conduct information and the, the magnitude at which nerves conduct information. And all of these things, there's testosterone has its fingers in so many things. And it's a little bit of that message in each place. Now, the part you're most interested in is from the nucleus. Now there's messaging off to the surface of the cell and from the surface of the cell to something called ribosomes. Ribosomes are the little machinery that actually tick out the proteins. The best analogy I can think of is if you think of movies from the turn of the 20th century, there's always that uh, stock market ticker that ticks off a tape and it's like a little binary thing. And there's always people, you know, peeling through the tape, looking at the, the, the stock market. Well, that's very analogous of how a ribosome works. The ribosome is the little ticker and the protein is the ribbon that comes out of it. The ticker says, oh, make contractile quadricep muscle and so it does and it goes you know one lysine one glucine one one amino you know one amino acid after the another and then collectively that becomes the protein that's then folded and packaged and put in place to make the quadricep bigger so that's kind of the chain of events is you know testosterone is key lock transmission nucleus interprets the message sends more messages out to the various places this shit needs to be done one of those places is the ribosome and it tells the ribosome hey make more contractile skeletal muscle and so the ribosome has a blueprint in itself and there's a, a lot of complicated stuff that you get you know rna dna transcription translation it's all very complicated but the short answer is the ribosome knows how to do that and so it goes to work ticking out this ribbon of protein that's going to be quadricep or whatever. Um, this is not a show about drugs, but just to illustrate something that your listeners might have raised an eyebrow at, all steroids click into that same key lock scenario. The difference is testosterone sends a very general blanket message, do a little bit of this, do a little bit of that. Each individual steroid has been derivated in such a way by clever organic chemists so that it clicks into the lock, turns the key, sends a message to the nucleus, but the nucleus interprets a slightly different message. Less water retention, less carbohydrate retention, more muscle protein synthesis, or more neurological influence, less this, less that. So it's the same kind of group of information, but just sent in maybe different ratios and arrangements. If that helps you, that's why all steroids kind of trick the cells into thinking they're testosterone, but then send a slightly different message. That's why one drug can be better at building muscle. One drug be better at, you know, stimulating neurology and one drug doesn't convert to estrogen as well as others and that sort of thing. Just just for background information, it might help, you know, kind of build a bigger you know, mental construct of what's going on here. Does that help? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and I think uh, I think another thing that m might also be mentioned since we're already on the topic of performance enhancing drugs that people seem to not understand that if you're talking about an anthate, uh, and decanate, that there's different things. But what is actually the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I I'm gonna. My, my last near stroke was on this very topic, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, this is the uh, analogy I used, and, and I think it's I, – I don't want to belabor the analogy thing to death, but in this case, it's perfect. I think this is one – I think this is my best work. People use words that they don't understand. I, I'm guilty of it too. I'll say words like, you know, mortgage and interest rates. And I don't know what the fuck that stuff is, but I still say it. So I'm guilty of the same thing. I have sympathy. But people say things like, you know, Esther and Enanthate and Cipionate. They have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. They're just words. They don't have any concept. So I'm going to give you a visual concept of what those words mean. Okay. Something that everyone even in the third world, even in the poorest village in Africa, peanut butter and jelly. Okay, Anybody can conceptualize two pieces of bread, one gets peanut butter, one gets jelly. Two words, peanut butter and jelly. Okay, testosterone, enanthate. Testosterone, enanthate, peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter is always fucking peanut butter. Doesn't matter, it's peanut butter, it's peanut butter, it's peanut butter. Jelly could be that disgusting orange shit with the peel in it. It could be raspberry, strawberry, grape. Jelly can be a lot of different things. And 
jelly changes the nature of the sandwich, but you know what it never changes? The fucking peanut butter. Peanut butter is peanut butter. Testosterone is always testosterone. But over here on the jelly side, it can be testosterone enanthate, testosterone propionate, cypionate, decanate, undecanate, undecacyclinate. It can be a lot of things. But at the end of the day, the peanut butter comes through unscathed as, guess what? Fucking peanut butter! That's it. That's that's the whole story. Each ester has its own life and its own, you know, the rate and temperature at which it dissolves. And all of there's a lot of differences. But at the end of the day, when the jelly goes away, you know what you're left with? The peanut butter. Testosterone in any format ultimately hits your bloodstream as testosterone. The jelly part of the song only affects the speed at which that peanut butter is delivered. The larger the ester, the longer it takes to dissolve, and therefore, the more time-released your peanut butter is. The shorter the ester, the easier it dissolves. Actually, a concept that's pretty easy to understand. You know, a short-chain ester dissolves quicker than a long-chain ester. A short-chain ester, like propionate, dissolves pretty quickly, three days, and releases your peanut butter in three days. A giant amalgam of ester, like, uh, you know, undecanate, takes... 30 days to dissolve so your peanut butter dribbles out very slowly but at the end of the day the thing that dribbles out still the fucking peanut butter end of story that's a that's a great explanation peanut butter and jelly yeah yeah i really like that (laughs) a little sarcastic but that's kind of my way i can't help it yeah but like like i said people don't seem to understand the concept of well it's 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 different uh It, different names and, and different functions for the different drugs but at the end of the day the the raw material or what you're looking for is exactly the same it's the the, the del- delivery that's that difference but anyways let's take the last question and then we'll wrap this up uh, sure. when it comes to nutrition uh, oh. for someone that's on performance enhancing drugs compared to someone who's not on it Is there any difference, for example, you sometimes hear people say, well, if you're using steroids, you need to eat more protein because then you can use actually more protein to build muscle. So what's your what's your take on that? Well, I hate the way you phrased that question. What's my take on that? Um, please don't misunderstand. I'm not sitting around, you know, dreaming up this shit in a vacuum. It's not like my take. Mm -hmm. There's been studies done by real scientists in real labs, really measuring, you know, nitrogen retention and body weights, and they have complicated scales, and they wear white coats, and they all look very professional. So this is not, I'm not doing this shit. Stop blaming me, people. Okay, I live in a house. I don't have a fucking laboratory. Although I wish I did, because I would then retire to my laboratory to be all quite funny and i would giggle like a child but that's separate okay there's studies on nitrogen attention going back to the 1940s okay this is really not in the realm of opinion at this point nitrogen requirements for normal healthy human beings have been defined the u.s F, uh, fda pinned it at 0.8 grams per kilogram okay the reality is it looks like maybe One gram per kilogram was the number they should have landed on. And coincidentally, pretty much every nation around the world has done very similar tests in the 1940s and 50s. And they all came up with about the same number. Japan landed on one gram per kilogram. The Soviet Union actually was like 1.2 grams per kilogram. But everybody was right in that 0.8 to 0.2. Every civilized nation on the world that was capable of science did this shit because they didn't want their population to starve or die of rickets or what the fuck ever. And strangely, they all came up with the same number. That's it. Now, in modern times, you know, people have higher body weights. People actually engage in, you know, athletic endeavors. There's differences for sure. Lyle McDonald has written an entire book. It's titled The Protein Book, and it will quote every study I could quote because – He's goddamn good at his job, and he did this shit even before I was thinking about it. But in that book, you'll pretty much see study after study referenced that for exercise, for exercising athletes, particularly weight training, the range runs very roughly from two to three grams per kilogram. That's the numbers. Just, just it's really hard to avoid that. There are a couple aberrant studies that show some special things happening, particularly above and particularly below, and it's probably 
because of some then extra mechanism kicking in. There's some Eastern European studies that showed like 3.8 grams per kilogram was way better. And the reality is it was probably either because of total calorie load or because of saturated fat load. Because of the, you know, the protein was coming via the vector of red meat, something like that. But in general, on average, every study pretty much zones in on that two to three grams per kilogram. We're going to go with that. Now, in that range, here's where the fun begins. The mechanism of action of anabolic steroids, that, you know, lock key message to the nucleus, talk to the ribosome, actually is very simplistic, and there's more to the story. And one of the more to the story part is testosterone and associated anabolic steroids dumb down the amount of tissue that is damaged post-exercise. So the blanket definition that's put on that is improves nitrogen efficiency. Think about that word, efficiency. If the body can deal with nitrogen more efficiently, guess what it needs less of? Nitrogen. Mm -hmm. As you go up the scale of dosing, whether naturally produced or exogenously, you actually need less protein per kilogram than a natural does because naturals are, sorry guys, inefficient. So naturals waste more, so they have to consume more. Now, a a drug-using athlete will probably have a greater protein intake simply because drugs work and they will have a higher body weight, but the amount of nitrogen per kilogram of body weight is lower on ratio than a natural. And vice versa, by the same exact mechanism, drug-using athletes tend to consume more carbohydrates, not because there's some magic carbohydrate thing going on behind the scenes and, you know, there's little carbohydrate fairies running around burning up carbohydrates. No, drug users Drugs work, boys and girls. Drug users are bigger than naturals. We carry more muscle mass. Muscle mass loves carbohydrates. So, yes, I get to eat several hundred grams more carbohydrates than the natural guy sitting next to me because I weigh fucking kilograms and kilograms more than him. So, again, there's differences, but those differences are predicated more on outcome than they are actually on any under-the-hood magic thing. You know, it's not some, you know, Palumboian metabolic shift where, you know, if I take enough of this drug, I suddenly metabolize peanut butter and avocados. And, no, you're just making that shit up. But you, if you said to me, as I get ever more and more muscular, I can consume more body fat because I have more muscle to metabolize it, I wouldn't throw up my hands in disgust. I would still say, hmm, I wouldn't do it, but at least you're making sense. But, you know, this whole, like, you know, invoking voodoo is where I fall off the wagon. All of the rules of biology change until we change species. You just can't get out of that little paradigm there. We all basically have the same tools to work with. It's just some very fundamental dials we get to turn. One of them is the volume of lean mass. As the lean mass goes up, you can get away with more and more different things because you have a bigger buffer. You have a bigger engine to burn up the residual whatever you're talking about, be it fats, carbohydrates, or whatever. That That's pretty much all we got. Yeah, great explanation. Great. All right. I think um, I think we have everything that we need, but maybe we could give the <laughs> listeners... Maybe we can give the listeners um, a take-home message from from this uh, from this podcast. Stop being an asshole. <laughs> yeah, that's no, I, no, I don't, that's probably probably a bit much. Um, I'm never good at that. God, you put me on the spot. You put me under the gun. Um, he, I, I'm, this is not pre-prepared, so I'm going to fuck this up. But bear with me. Um, Stop thinking about this incredible chasm between naturals and unnaturals. Stop thinking they're separate species and simply start thinking of a sliding scale. If you're particularly disadvantaged, you're way down here on the scale. If you're particularly average, you're here. If you're particularly exceptional, you're here. And then if you're me and dial up hormones into the previously unknown level you're still on the same path you're just up here it's a sliding scale and therefore everything moves in the same direction the same way and follows the same rules it's just the margins get so very much bigger 
So stop trying to make this incredible differentiation. Oh, well, he could do that because he's on drugs. Or, oh, you know, if, if without drugs, he would be this or he would be that. Or I would be that guy. And just start thinking about tools at hand. Use them to the best of your abilities. And then, you know, moving off into that ethereal zone, make those decisions as needed. But understand that it's all the same train track, all going to the same destination. And I think that will help your thinking. And at least help your mindset as you're moving along that train track. Awesome, Broderick. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do this podcast. Always a pleasure to have you on. And I think uh, a lot of the listeners will appreciate the podcast that we've had today. Before we sign off, um, where can people find more information about you? Really, people need to leave me the fuck alone. I've had about enough of people, to be honest. <laughs> no, I said that's completely wrong and inappropriate. I'm sorry. Um, there's two things, actually, I should promote here, and I'm really bad at self-promotion, but uh, I will be appearing live in London, United Kingdom, December 1st. So that's a big deal, and it's, you know, your corner of the world. It's the European continent. So it'll be my first uh, actual real you know, kind of professional iteration there. So it's a big deal. It's going to be a great show. I believe the house has a seating capacity of 50, and I think we've already sold like 10 or so tickets. So it's it's moving, it's going. But um, I really, I take my job very, very seriously. I think that I'm pretty good at it. I will put on a great show. I will give you everything I've got. So I really suspect, uh, you know, it's going to be a hit. So uh, you can find tickets to that on the uh, Evil Genius Worldwide website, and uh, the Team Evil GSP Facebook page, There's, it's the first thing. It's pinned as the first item. So th that's definitely a big deal. And then secondarily, um, my last major overseas tour was Australia and uh, was part of a couple of really great and big events there. One of them was recorded and produced into a kind of a educational package. It's got a syllabus and, you know, video clips matching the syllabus. It's really, really well done. The people that put it together, yeah, I mean, spared no expense, way outspent what I think I'm worth, to be fair. But anyway, that product is for sale as a purchasable product. Uh, you can find that on the Evil Genius Down Under website. That product's so, such a big deal, they actually created their own website for it. Uh, like I said, I think it's beyond my personal you know, requirements, but great product. I really stand behind it. Um, it is actually not my product. I've signed off and they're completely handling it themselves, but I still feel so good about it that I feel that, you know, any of your listeners that want more of me and kind of want to see what the whole, you know, evil genius experience is, it's on that footage. So there, there it is. Awesome. And I'll link to everything that you just mentioned in the description oh, below so people can check that out. So, uh, so yeah, thanks again, Broderick, for taking the time. And hopefully I'll, or not hopefully, I'm, I guarantee you that I will send you an invite again. And I hope you accept that invitation so we can do another podcast together. Uh, despite my pissing and moaning, I really enjoy this. I like talking to people that are engaged and interesting and, uh, you know, willing to actually discuss this stuff. I, I really enjoy it. And I appreciate you and all of your listeners. I, I can't say that enough. Perfect. Thank you so much, Broderick, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you.